Hello, one and all. Welcome back to the A to the K Wrestling Show. We've got a unique, unique segment for you this week. Um, the first edition of what we're calling Superstar Spotlight. All about the late, great Eddie Guerrero himself and... Some interesting circumstances, Anthony, wasn't there? That kind of uh, that kind of brought this segment about. Yeah, I think um, you know, probably not the right reason to be inspired for him to be the first one in this segment, but it, it just seemed appropriate given the situation. In that, um, we found Eddie Guerrero to be trending on Twitter this week, and that was due to a particularly controversial tweet from a. a, a I won't give his name in case people want to try and be dicks about it. But uh, this particular Twitter user put up that uh, Eddie Guerrero was a B-plus player at best and people only hold him in such high regard because he is dead, which is a shitty comment to make. But this Mm. led to not just a large number of the Twitter community firing back and explaining why that is not the case. We actually led to some... um, Actually, some wrestlers, uh, I think Mick Foley was one of them as well, who come out and, and sort of acknowledge that tweet and why it was so fucking wrong. Um, and this, obviously, it sparked a conversation between you and I, Carl. Mm. Um, and this is sort of where this is sort of born from, of going, well, maybe we should talk about exactly what makes Eddie Guerrero. And I think it's fair to say at this point, Carl, both you and I disagree with that tweet. He was definitely uh, top tier, legend, A+, plus, however you want to phrase it. You know, he definitely earned his spot. And um, it's it's a totally uh, he he was already at the top of the biz uh, when he sadly um, passed away, mm. so I, I think it's a it's a totally inaccurate statement and most likely from someone who'd never watched his career if I'm honest, or yeah. only watched part of it. But uh, I think it's like without spoiling, I think it's fair to say we we both disagree with that and we both hold him with that high regard. So really, it's let's talk about. What's what's made him so so great, and what put him to the top of the business, and you know what made him so sort of ingrained and famous within the wrestling community? Yeah, Defo. I think it's it's fascinating, really, isn't it? I think he's he's always had this stigma about him. I think you know we know he started out in Japan. Um, I think he was he was Black Tiger two. Um, you know that's where he kind of cut his teeth. He was having matches with the likes of Benoit and and Jericho and stuff like that. But he's always kind of been one of the smaller guys and definitely not your kind of cookie cutter, you know, top of the mountain WWE kind of guy. Um, Mm. So I think obviously he had that stint in Japan and that's where he started to kind of almost break out, but in a way that, you know, I think has had a lasting impact almost in terms of how people viewed him because of, you know, he, he was one of the smaller guys and he, was very technical he had a slightly different style and a lot of people you know felt they never really truly could see him um as that that main event received especially like this guy with with the tweet yeah well it's like this like um let's be like there was a time when i don't think a lot of people would have seen him as a as a main event or even a main event in wwe i mean a lot of the stints i think um both you and I would have remembered his earliest times because I didn't really follow New Japan, but um, I did follow WCW for a time, and I think a lot of the mm. the earlier work from from Eddie and a lot of what made him famous, obviously with um, with the likes of Dean Malenko and Rey Mysterio, and that was uh, was his work in WCW, and um, you know the the main part of WCW I remember with Eddie was um, obviously he had some some feuds with Jericho, which he did in Japan, but was um, his work with Rey Mysterio in the Cruiserweight division. Mm-hmm. And you know, let's face it, Eddie was five foot eight and suited the cruiserweight division perfectly and typically is someone who, if I'm being honest, like and we'll talk about why I'm so wrong about this, but if I'm being honest, if you look at a like, five foot eight guy in WCW in the cruiserweight division and you asked me at the time, is he gonna be a world champion in WWE one day? I'd have said no. Right? Mm-hmm. And I don't think that's I don't think that's unfair at the time, but it just shows you how this man was able to, to, to change that dynamic, I suppose. Yeah. Because he, he, he was such a believable champion. But, um, but yeah, for me, like first points and first time I really started to notice Eddie um, was, and probably, you know, I was very young at the time as well. So probably earliest wrestling memories really would be that the WCW cruiserweight division and, and him killing it with Rey Mysterio at the time. Yeah. I think, you know, the point you made, like, if if you kind of looked at him then similar to his time in Japan, but when it was when he was in WCW, it was like one of the vanilla midgets, wasn't he? You know, the, it was uh, lovingly, uh, you know, given that name. I think it was from Kevin Nash. Um, 
But you know, straight yeah, away that was like definitely a Kevin Nash uh, term, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and like that was, <laughs> you know, to your point, like that that gave him that stigma attached to him where people would look at him and they'd never think he'd be a world champion. And obviously after WCW, he, he made his transition into WWE as part of the, the Radicals, the stable with um, with Benoit and Perry Saturn and Dean Malenko. And um, straight away then as well, I don't think even WWE, I think, you know, I thought they didn't see it because he was brought in um, and... It was around the um, European title and stuff like that. Obviously, he was still yeah. quite slender then. He was still quite small, um, but it was. I think he, it was here where he really started to to get over. He obviously he he developed that uh, Latino heat uh, character, and he had yeah, the program yeah. with China with like Mamacita and stuff like that. And you know, obviously European champ. I think he got the IC title as well. Um, and he just started to kind of. Because, I mean, there's, there's two kind of aspects of being a, a main event A-plus a player, isn't there? You've got to be, you know, you've got to have the chops in the ring and you've got to have the chops on the mic. And I think, yeah, you know, everybody knew Eddie had the skills um, in the ring, but his promo work wasn't great and he was small. And so those two things were kind of always going to keep him back. And I think he just started to create this persona in Latino Heat that was getting really over and showing yeah. that he had a lot of charisma as well. And then... Unfortunately, like it, I mean, <laughs> Latino Heat was was attitude era, very much attitude era, and this was like when you and me were in high school, and everyone loved wrestling, mm-hmm. and he was Latino Heat was definitely over as fuck, and he was such a, a lovable character, even at that point, and like you say, it developed into into other, like it furthered into into what he became, but um, like you say, it was uh, he, that was when he really started to show he was um, he was a character. In, in that sense as well with the promo work and, and everything he did with China. Yeah, even like, like, like even like obviously the stuff with the roses and like having his own unique weapon with the lead pipe that would be hidden in the roses and you know it was it was different and it was something which you know he, he definitely did get himself over and I think obviously you know unfortunately it was around that time he ended up getting released wasn't it? I think, I'm not sure if it was a DUI uh, yeah, like a, dr- I, I a drink know, driving um, thing or something. Yeah, I know he, he, this was the point he started suffering with with um I know it was alcohol was one of them, but I think there was um a, a, like substances in general, mm. um and I think he he spent it like he was fired, but he only spent a year away, um yeah. to and you know he, he cleaned himself up and he actually um this is when I think he really hit the um the sort of peak I suppose and this is probably where he was headed anyway, but we saw him come back I want to say about two thousand and one. So when we're starting to get into the, um, let's say, the ruthless aggression, right into the ruthless aggression era, Carl. Um, and we had uh, Los Guerreros, so we had Chavo joining them. We had uh, a fantastic run on the tag team. We had, obviously, Viva La Raza. We had, um, you know, we rock up in the lowriders all the time. <laughs> the, the the tactics in the ring become more comical because they've done that, you know, we lie, we cheat, we steal. So mm-hmm. it's stuff that we see mimicked to this day. We saw, out of nowhere, we saw Ricochet, like, a few weeks back, mimic that whole um, throw the chair to somebody's hands and then lie down like you've been hit to get the to get the DQ to, you know, whatever means necessary kind of approach. And, mm. and those sort of, um, those playful aspects in the ring were, like, really really fun and I mean he was already a great technician in the ring let's be honest but like the the whole persona that the pair of them did together in the, in the tag scene and eventually leading towards um obviously where him going into the main title picture this was the this, this was what built him into into like that that character you know and um to be honest the only um it wasn't even a bad thing but like the only stuff that maybe didn't work too well was the whole um like the the program with with ray and and dominic and stuff like that but again that was probably more a product of the time than anything but it was still Mm. sold really well between a lot of them in all fairness but um yeah i mean his comeback i think was probably where he was heading anyway but maybe that time out and coming back with charvo and having that time in the tag scene just rounded them out i mean it was another set of belts he's won isn't it as well yeah, I think again it was another example of something different that no one else had done before, like the low riders and stuff. Um, obviously, I know you were a big fan of that because you're proper into your cars, aren't you? So I remember, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, we'd come out with a with a fucking you know sexy car every week, fucking like bouncing around the place, and it was different and it felt fresh and it felt like you know you'd get behind him and stuff like that. And you know, the, one of the biggest compliments that I can give him is the fact that you know. My dad, who was a very old school, you know, wrestling fan, like 1992 Royal Rumble with me, he was like his, you know, his favorite time in wrestling as well. And I think he was very much tuned out of the product, but 
he saw Eddie and he loved Eddie. He loved the stuff he did, the light cheating, the steel and the throw the thing and like drop down. And he said it was just, it was a throwback for him, you know, to see it reminded mm-hmm. him of like the, the old school times and like, yeah, but, but it was like, it was a, a heel tactic to do, but as a face, you know what I mean? And it was, it was just something so different and so such, comical. That was such a, a unique thing about this gimmick was like, they were so open, like the whole, the, even their entrance music was, we lie, we cheat, we steal. Mm. And they were over with the crowd and they were faces and like, they were blatantly like cheating and stuff like that. And you're like, this is like you say, it's heel stuff, but people were loving it. And they were just so sort of honest about it. I mean, they walked to the ring with a song, telling them, telling them exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> yes. And uh, we still loved it. And it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's, um, you don't see that too often. It was similar to, like, not similar. This is a really bad comparison in a way, but I always see echoes of, like, Los Guerreros with stuff like, uh, like when Crime Time were, like, your bad mm. guys, they were stealing, but, like, they were yeah. over at the same time, do yeah. you know what I mean? And I always feel like that kind of echoed this, a similar thing where it's, like, you, you, you're doing bad guy things, but in a face way. I feel like Los Guerreros sort of pushed that sort of concept in a way. Yeah, no, definitely you're right. I think the thing that made the big difference was the charisma. I think a lot of the time when someone gets saddled with a gimmick like that, they become a heel when they're doing it because they just don't have that level of charisma to to get the fans behind you, no matter what you're given. And I think, yeah. you know, init- initially from old interviews and stuff that I've read, I don't think Eddie was a big fan initially of that lie, cheat, steal persona. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, look That's how it... even more impressive that he got it over. Exactly. Look how it turned out for him. He just like it's easy to look back on it now retrospectively but you know just the stuff he did the mannerisms like his little you know like uh, sh- shuffles and shit that he would do with his uh you know and like you know hitting himself and all that kind yeah. of stuff it was just i mean if we're honest like eddie as a person from what like obviously we didn't know him as a person i don't want anyone trying to be a smart ass about it when i say as a person but like from what we could see as a person you know when you see him in interviews when you see him in honest interviews when you see him in backstage promos when you see him in the ring there's just something so charming about the guy that you couldn't not like him yeah and i think that that he could turn anything into gold just because of that because there was just something so inherently likable about the guy yeah it's uh, i mean saying that i'm trying to think you know other than the angle with Rey Mysterio, with the I'm your pappy thing, like, did he work very much as a heel as he started I'm to ascend? I'm trying to remember a significant time as a heel, and I honestly can't think of a decent one. Like, I think maybe Los Guerreros at one point were originally booked as heels, but mm. I don't think it was ever received well enough as heels. That You don't remember it. That You always remember the face stuff, and, yeah. and you remember, like, enjoying them and the crowd being so over with them, so... I'd have to go back and watch and see if they were like if WWE's intent was for them to be a heel and it just didn't work. Um, mm. But I, 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 I don't know. I can't remember any significant time spent as a as a heel character. No, I, me I mean, neither. Attitude era with China, maybe. Um, I mean, so obviously when he came in with the Radicals, he was a heel and stuff then. But I think he was only just kind of finding his feet, wasn't he? Um, yeah, I mean that'd be like going back to like the like Latin World Order in WCW and, and comparing it to that. It's like that was like you say when he was developing his character, I suppose. Yeah, but, but uh, I think like I think to your point, you know, owing to his natural charisma and the fact that he was just so likable as a character, that's probably why it wasn't believable a lot of the time for him to be a bad guy because you'd look at him and you would just be like, I, you know, you'd, you'd smile or you'd laugh with me with the stuff he did. So I think yeah. um, you know charisma was just. I think what he lacked in height, he certainly made up for in charisma and heart. I think um, so. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's one of them. It's it, it's baffling that we look at someone like him and think he's never going to be a world champion. He hasn't got the size for it. He hasn't got the charisma and whatever. And to see obviously what he went on to achieve effectively is a uh... thing is though like it, it's funny when you say about size because when you look back like he wasn't a big guy but no. he fucking made himself look big mm-hmm. like he didn't look ridiculous in the title scene and he he, he knew how to pack the muscle on because he, he didn't he didn't look uh, out of place at all and yeah. he, was, he was definitely bigger than he was in WCW, but it just happened so gradually that I didn't realise. But like when you look at him in his title run, he didn't look like a small guy by any means. I wouldn't have guessed five eight. No, no, I think um, he. It's it's crazy looking at his body transformation. I think because mm. when he first came into WWE, he was still quite a slender guy, not much muscle, 
um, at all. I mean, I and, suppose he was coming fresh out of the cruiserweight side of things, wasn't he? Really, there. Yeah, but I think obviously, you know, towards like the end, obviously before he passed away and stuff like that, he was he was huge, like ridiculously huge. Like he was, he had muscles in places I didn't even know there were places. Do you know what I mean? He was like, <laughs> yeah, he was like a monster. He was massive. Um, yeah. So I think obviously that will have helped. Um, but I think it's well documented. The likes of, you know, Benoit, the likes of um, Eddie, you know, the, who always felt like the small guys, they tried to overcompensate eventually with their bodies and trying mm. to make themselves look, you know, as big as they could do in terms of like, well, as wide as they could if they couldn't be tall, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. to kind of <laughs> overcompensate for it. So you definitely saw that body transformation in, in, in the pair of them, both Eddie and and Benoit, really. Um, yeah. But I think, do you know what? It, it was probably needed, which is an interesting point. Um, I don't think, regardless of all that, the likes of Vince would have been comfortable putting the, the title on him if he hadn't have made them changes. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's well established, Vince McMahon likes big sweaty men. <laughs> he certainly does. <laughs> the big Sorry, I apologise to Cultaholic now because that's one of those. <laughs> um but I, I mean yeah you know it's if if you if you look at look at history uh, that seems to be the case you know he's a he's a big fan of of bodies he started his own bodybuilding federation for god's sake so um so i, th- I think obviously that was potentially the final thing that helped vince kind of buy into him i think it was clear he was super technically gifted you know fantastic wrestler he developed his promo and charisma like off the charts and it was literally he isn't going to grow any taller so what else could he do so he had to get he had to find the body i think it was them three ingredients that helped him effectively make that step up yeah no i totally agree it's um yeah it's just it's interesting really that's uh they were like because you mentioned benoit as well and i think i mentioned this here off the air but like there was a comment from Kenny Omega not too long back about all this controversy around uh, controversy discussion around Daniel Bryan and CM Punk and he said something along the lines of about um, you know breaking through every ceiling in a company that wasn't made for them or something along that line because obviously they didn't fit the mold that Vince McMahon has for the for that title scene and I think um, you know let, let, while, we're, while we're talking about people who did that I mean Benoit and Guerrero were the, like for me the, like two of the first I ever knew to do that because neither mm-hmm. of them fitted that mould and they both wore it in the same night yeah it was um, you know it was it was a wonderful Wrestlemania moment that I can't remember um, I think we, we've obviously we've ranked this before um, we have it's up um, there I'm, I'm desperately trying to remember it but I'm going to get it wrong so I'm just not going to try yeah it's def- <laughs> I think it's definitely in the in the top half he says I'm probably wrong but I think it's definitely <laughs> like uh, five, like around five maybe six or five something like that Um but it was it was a beautiful moment for for the two of them that they spent their whole lives being told that they couldn't and they went on and you know they could and they ended up winning that and um you know it, it was a, it was a wonderful moment but i guess coming back to the original kind of tweet um from from the person who who tweeted it calling him a b plus uh, plus player um i don't know why 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 do you think why do you think that is i'm i'm this might sound controversial for me I what? disagree. I disagree with the tweet. I do think he is an A, A plus player. Right. But I still think there's a tier of, like an S tier category of, like I wouldn't put Eddie in the same category as, you know, Rock Austin, Taker, Brett. I wouldn't. But. You seen Brock. Rock. Oh, I was gonna say, what the fuck is Rock even on that list? No, it's Brock. Sorry, no. go on. Um, so like, you know, you've got like your, you know, Hogan, Rock, Austin, Cena, Brett. That like, you know, what I mean, they were like their own level. They were the guy, right? So I don't think Eddie was was on that level. I the thing is, I take your points, but I honestly truly believe that the only reason he wasn't at that level of being the guy was sadly due to his his death Mm. no i think it definitely is is a factor of it like there's other like for example i'm just just thinking about like sorry not to think but i just like the reason i say that is because i'm just thinking about like 
if you look at like you know the the the, the latter half of his career in that title scene he was going up against Brock Lesnar and JBL and and all the top people of the of the ruthless mm-hmm. aggression era and you know was he was a, he was a mainstay and he was a, he was he was a top guy and you know we just sadly we never had the the time served as supposed to be considered the guy do you know what i mean yeah defo i don't um i don't want what i'm saying to be misconstrued like there's a lot of guys no, who no. were the guy like Shawn michaels was the guy i wouldn't put Shawn michaels in that same category i wouldn't put yeah. Kurt angle in that same category but i would call them a plus players yeah. um well we, I, we we've established many a time we love Kurt angle yeah exactly and like Ed, eddie exactly the same for me he is an a plus player so Part of me wonders whether the original tweet was just, you know, whether he was classing or she, whoever it was, was classing it as, you know, your, like he's B plus because the A is like rock and stuff. You know what I mean? Coming out from that lens, in which case, I mean, this I, might not I've be, got a bit of sympathy. Not this, might not consider this totally right though, but do you not think like a lot of the people who, who you're listing there, like Bar and Cena, if I'm honest, mm. were people who hit their peak in the attitude era when I think Eddie hit his peak in a totally different era. So you're comparing them at different times as well. Yeah. Because let's face it, the ruthless aggression era and the reality area, 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 area Jesus Christ. Where's, era. Right, era. Era. Right. They, uh, they just, think of tight, just think of Titus O'Neil. Oorah. Right. <laughs> and then. They haven't, yeah. um, they haven't produced anywhere near the number of stars that came out of that attitude era. Do you know what? It's it's a fantastic point. I think um, Cena. The reason I put him on that other echelon is because he he was the guy. He he was the guy for a shockingly long time as yeah, well. I dare he, say longer than the Rock ever was. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, longer than the Rock, longer than Austin. Yeah, he's longer than I mean, Brett probably. Um, not, you know what? If we give it enough time, it'd be longer than Hogan. Yeah, and that's saying something. <laughs> Hogan exactly. was there at this WrestleMania, so that's still saying something. Yeah, but um, I think you've 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 made a phenomenal point in that you know there just wasn't talent produced like that. There's only been so many the guys who carried the company on their back um, for you know them periods of time. And it's like to your point, like I wouldn't put Brock Lesnar up there. You could argue he's been the guy for a bit. Um, see, I'd, he's he's an oddity, Brock. He's something to see. You know what I mean. He's impressive as fuck, but he's never been the guy. Or he's never even like all due respect to him. He's never been the whole package. No, no, he he's just. You can't deny it's it's something special when you see him, and people will always tune in to see him. But I don't know. I don't think you could have ever considered him the guy. I would agree with that. Yeah, and it's the same with like you know, Batista was like a world champion for a bit. You know, Orton has been world champion stuff for a bit. They're nowhere near that that tier either. You know, there's loads of people who love Shawn Michaels, and yeah, he's phenomenal. But you know, he it's not your guy. It's not. He's not my guy. Um, <laughs> but no, I like. I I honestly think Eddie was so close to making it into that like S tier level. And I think to your point, yeah. if he would have had more time, maybe he would have got there. Because by all I, accounts, I truly believe he would have. By all accounts, he was going to go into a program with Shawn Michaels, and he was going to you know, go into some of these other programs that would have helped, I don't know, just add more layers to him. Like, the more people he would have got an opportunity to work with, the more compelling storylines, the more, you know, opportunity he would have had to show the the sides to him that he would always deliver on. Um, yeah. Because, obviously, yeah. one of the more endearing um, periods of, of SmackDown for me during the, the reality era, was it reality era? Ruthless aggression era, most likely, was... Um, Eddie being the foil to JBL because it just played so well against JBL's character. Yeah, I mean those two just so like they bounced off each other so well. Like he was, you know, oh, yeah. he was, you know, the, the the stuff he did with like the um, the immigrants and you know anti Mexico and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, it was just it was a great rivalry. I think them two that they had. It, it, yeah, and if you think about that that time in wrestling, like that was some of the best stuff we were seeing. If we're honest, mm. yeah, and it's weird though. Right, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, but you know, you mentioned around like the level of star that WWE was producing at the time, and I, I love JBL. Don't get me wrong, but I don't think he was anywhere near that tier. I don't even, like JBL's probably is a a, a B plus. I I would agree. I think JBL is incredibly good at what he does, but he was good at 
helping build other people. Mm. Like he was good at helping build the guy because he knew exactly what he was doing in the ring. He was impressive on the mic. He had all the skills, but was never the that that he was never the guy. You know mm. what I mean? He was. I, I totally agree that he would be B plus. Um, and again, some people might disagree, but it's all subjective, isn't it? Um, but no, I would totally agree with that. But like the work he did with Eddie was part of what helped build Eddie to what Eddie is. Do you know what I mean? So like mm. he, he's an important um, tool in the business, let's say. But like yeah. you say, I don't think I don't think he was an A plus. No, and I mean we we can riff about it, we can talk about it. I got I, I noted down some stats because obviously we're looking at his legacy, and it, it's good for us to have our input and our thoughts. But oh yeah. Um, you know, WWE themselves in one of the DVD release uh, box sets ranked him as the 11th greatest professional wrestler of all time. Nice. So that's pretty pretty high when you consider how many pro wrestlers there are. Um, they ranked him fifth greatest of all time on on the SmackDown brand. I don't know whether that's too low. If I'm honest. That um, is for me. That's too low. So yeah, I'd be, I'd be keen to see he, who ranked him. There was on. a point in time for me that he was holding the SmackDown brand up. Mm. Like I don't think that's fair at all. No, so that won't surprise me. You've got Ric Flair, who said Guerrero uh, is in his top ten of all time opponents. Now, fucking Ric Rick, Rick Flair's wrestled I mean, everyone. The amount of, that's the thing. The amount of people Ric Flair's faced to be in the top ten is impressive, isn't it? To be fair. Yeah. So you know that carries a lot of weight. Um, oh, I wish I wouldn't have just said that then, because this is going to make so many fucking puns. Speaking of people carrying a lot of weight, no, I'm joking. Oh. Um, so Chris Jericho, um, he said that Eddie was the best performer in the world when he was on. Um, and I, maybe maybe we'll come on to that in a second, actually, um, in terms of what he means by that. Um, but I also have got Kurt Angle saying he's the second greatest wrestler of all time behind Shawn Michaels. So Honestly, I thought Angle might have even gone behind me. But, uh, <laughs> it's true. Taste, it's true. <laughs> He's never won anything with a broken freaking neck. That's just the kind of thing Kurt would say. Um, so obviously a lot of high praise from you know the company itself as well as some of the top tier guys um, in the company. But also we put the poll out there on our Instagram to our followers, um, and overwhelmingly you know A plus um, was eighty eight percent of the votes. B plus was twelve percent of the votes. So it just shows you twelve percent of people were wrong. Yes, 12% of people don't have a clue. Um, but no, I think, um, yeah, it's it's one of them. So I want to go back to, to what Jericho said there, which is he was the best performer in the world when he was on. And I never really noticed this that much. Um, but a lot of people have said that you can clearly see when his heart just wasn't in it at certain points. And obviously mm. we know he battled a lot of substance abuse stuff and just before his death, he managed to kind of turn all that around and he was clean and sober. But, you know, this could be a, a great, great assumption. But I guess the damage was already done. We know he, he passed away because of acute heart failure. Um, mm. We don't know whether that was because of, you know, any of the stuff he'd been doing prior to... That's trouble. It's like very speculative, isn't it? But... Yeah. Um, but obviously that's what, that's what a lot of people have speculated about. But I think... There was clearly a point there in his life he was going through some dark times and to Jericho's point he was the best when he was on. But it's like I'd never even really I can't really recall anything where it was like, Okay, you can tell he's his heart's not in it. I think every time Eddie stepped out there and was in front of the fans, he just he was on, you know what I mean, in, in my opinion. Yeah. Um The only thing I could say to that, because I've I don't think I've ever seen anything where he looked off let's say mm. um the only thing i could say is jericho's worked with him in japan and wcw so he might be able to note times that he wasn't particularly on that yeah. we've never seen maybe mm. i just don't know but um as you say certainly in all the time we've seen uh, on on tv um he's always he's always looked spot on to be fair yeah like, like I say, i've never noticed anything i must say no but yeah um so i think we we Instagram, some of the best wrestlers in the world are all in agreement that Eddie Guerrero is certainly an A plus player um, and one of the greatest of all time. So, yeah, interesting. Um, I don't know. Obviously, I'm not as uh, I don't spend that much time on Twitter as such um, as opposed to other platforms. So I don't know whether you saw what the general 
like was there a lot of people who supported what this this person said or was it overwhelmingly for some, for the other some way? reason twitter gets massively aggressive so <laughs> like i would dare say i can i can tell you now it was in it was they were very much against this person like most people um I would dare say even more than 88% were, were in favour of saying he was an A-plus player. But sadly, because it's Twitter, they didn't just go, no, he's definitely an A-plus player. I disagree. Um, this guy was like, up for getting lynched and everything because, you know, apparently that's how it works. So, um, you know, let's get super aggressive about it. But, uh, but no, like, it seems to be overwhelmingly on that direction on Twitter as well. That like I, w- I dare say over 90%. Was hmm. was the same feeling that it's like yeah he was definitely an A plus player you can't argue with that at all yeah okay that's uh that's good to know then obviously that from you know Eddie's legacy that he's left behind I think you know you I think a lot of people as well probably just don't appreciate it because he didn't live it at the time and there'll be other people who just like look back you know fondly and go oh yeah Eddie was one of the greats but I think you need to watch it you need to see. His career, you need to see where he where he started and that growth. Because I think if anything, everyone anyone who followed him saw it happen in front of our eyes and saw what he became. And I think that in itself was um, like proof in the pudding of, of what a megastar he'd become by fine tuning all his skills. Yeah, to be honest, I honestly think it'd make a great biopic. I think it'd be a good way of informing everyone about his career as a whole. Yeah, I could see, I definitely see that. You know. Trouble is, you can't get people to understand by saying something like, "Go back and watch like three decades nearly worth of um, wrestling, right back mm. to WCW all the way through to fully understand." Um, because they're not going to do it. But if you could get like a decent biopic about him, where they, they highlight his career as best they can, I think that'd be the best way of um, of highlighting his career. Really. Do you know what, Anthony? Let's write it. I'd love to see that. Um... All the elements are there, really. If you if you look at his his story, it is a story of, you know, of tragedy, of triumph, of, you know, being told you can't and going on to to prove everybody wrong. Um, and obviously, it has the kind of sad ending that people seem to love in these kind of <laughs> biopics. So, um, yeah, I think you're right. I, think, that. Yeah. I, I, I I'd love I'd love to see it. Um, his story be told because he yeah. is a legend and he is definitely an A plus player. Totally agree. So yeah, that was the segment. That was our first superstar spotlight, um, shining the spotlight bright on a very bright star himself in Eddie Guerrero. Um, who would you like us? You know, who would you like to see us do this? Uh, do this on next. Let us know on the socials. Let us know in the comments. Um, obviously, it won't be a super regular uh, segment because we like to change it up. We like to have something different for you every week because that's just the kind of guys we are um but yeah we will be bringing this back this will become somewhat uh regular um segments so let us know who should we uh who should we shine the spotlight on next and this is different obviously if you've ever seen any of our previous segments on things like um you know why we love this particular wrestler like eg care angle or edge or the history of segments where we kind of dive into the career um and kind of pick out things you know this is Slightly different. This is just picking a superstar and just chatting about what we remember of them and how we yeah, find them. It's really. um, essentially more condensed, isn't it? We don't want to go into the full history. We want to, uh, hence the term spotlights because we want to talk about exactly what what made them great to us. And mm-hmm. um, I think uh, I think it's a perfect title for it. Or not in some cases, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, just saying, spotlight and... doesn't necessarily mean it has to be uh, all positive. Yeah, that's it. It'd be like one of those, like you know, courtroom spotlights, where we're like, yeah, right, right, yeah, face. We could, um, um, could do one about um, Goldberg. <laughs> Maybe we, yeah. Hmm. I don't think that'd be a spotlight. You couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't control yourself. I don't think. Um, I wouldn't yeah. be that negative. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but no, that was obviously our first superstar spotlight. Let us know your thoughts. Let us know who you'd like to see next, and we'll be back after this lovely message uh, with what happened in the previous week in wrestling. You're watching or listening to A to the K. 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 These guys are awesome. Check it out. Check it out. Change your life. You'll be thanking me later. 